I had always been on the best of terms with Eliza's mother. She occasionally obliged me with a little temporary financial advance in times of pressure and refused interest, though offered. I frequently wrote to her, always including any witticism, if suitable, that I might have heard in the city. I have made it abundantly clear on previous occasions that I take it as no small slight that my name did not appear in her will, although I bear the dear departed no grudge. I am in no doubt that my omission was entirely to do with Eliza's brother, Frank, uh, an individual with whom I am delighted to say I have little or nothing in common. The period of our married life with which I am currently occupied began with Eliza's mother's funeral, and uh, I must add a few words on the subject of that unfortunate day. All Frank had got to do was to come to me and say, uh, This sad event puts me in a rather responsible position, and I should be glad of a few words of advice from a man with your knowledge of the world. Uh, I should have said politely, by all means, let us go into the question thoroughly. Nothing of the kind happened. He did not come to me in that way, and I am far from being the sort of man that sticks himself forward. Uh, the inevitable consequences followed, as they so often do. It seems to me now a providential blessing that Eliza was down with the influenza at the time and unable to attend the funeral. Not to mince matters, it was not so much a funeral as a fiasco, bungled from the very start, as I knew it would be. It all happened years ago, or more, and even now it gives me no pleasure to dwell upon it. I would sooner drop the subject. What else could be expected? The, the undertaker employed was quite in a small way, had to hire everything, and, so far as I could see, took no sort of personal interest in his work. Whatever else the driver of the second coach may have been on the way back, he, he was certainly not sober. But it is a painful topic, and the less said about it, the better. It's, uh... Uh, but in, in quitting the topic, I should like to say just one word as to the actual fittings. Uh, when my time comes, whether the plate on the coffin is of silver or brass, I, I do hope at any rate that my name will be engraved on it straight and not cockeyed. Uh, that is one of the first points I should have impressed upon Frank, uh, if asked. Uh, however, he is, after all, Eliza's brother, and in any case, as I have already implied, I prefer to draw a veil over the whole affair. Otherwise, I should uh, have had a word to say on the subject of refreshments. Uh, I took it for granted that wine and sandwiches, or at the very least biscuits, would have been handed, but uh, they were not handed or even suggested. It may have been a simple lack of foresight, or there may have been another reason. Uh, it, it is of no use to dwell on these things. We, we cannot recall the past. After all, there are pleasanter things to talk about, and if I linger one moment on the question of the trousers worn by Frank at the funeral, it, it is merely to show the reader that I do not grumble without cause. You see, dark grey they may have been, and if he likes to say that they were very dark grey, I shall not deny it. My point is that they were not black. It all resolves itself in my mind into a question of respect for the deceased, and, and that is my last word about it. Fortunately, it is not necessary for me to say anything as to the near-side horse in the second coach, because everything I have said about Frank's trousers applies to that horse equally. Uh, I do not blame the horse, and I do not blame the undertaker. Uh, being quite in a small way, he probably had to take what he could get. Uh, but I must and do blame the man who selected the undertaker on his own initiative, without asking for the advice that an older and wiser man was quite ready to give him. I will not pursue the subject further. I, I prefer to wipe the whole thing out of my mind. <laughs> I'm not at all sure that one of these days I shall not make out a list of all the different things that were wrong at the funeral of Eliza's mother, uh, simply as a matter of curiosity. Still, so far as things went, there was an improvement in our circumstances, and at about the same time I received the further advance in salary that had been promised me. Eliza and I were able to leave the little house we occupied and became the tenants of an altogether grander dwelling. I thought, and said, when we moved into Meadow Suite, that it would be more in accordance with that kind of house if we kept two servants. Call it three. Three girls, besides the butler, of course. The chauffeur will have to sleep in the orchard house, but that can be arranged right away. Toot toot. If you wish to be funny, I simply decline to continue the conversation. 
All I ask is for one fair cook and one house parlour maid. Then if we have the cook fair, we better pick a dark house parlourer so that we shan't get them mixed. No, you don't. All you'll get is one general and occasional help if wanted. You're the sort of man that's used to elevenpence, gets a shilling and wants to spend half a crown on the strength of it. <sighs> we had some further discussion, but I did not press the point. I very rarely interfere in these domestic matters, my mind having rather a wider scope. Perhaps it would be better if I took a more active part. With all her merits, I never should have engaged Parker. I can lay my hand on my heart and affirm that positively, and I have told Eliza so. She came in on a Friday. Her appearance did not seem to me to be greatly in her favour, being somewhat on the bulky side. She looked melancholy and was getting on in life. Forty-three, I should say. On Saturday, Eliza told me that she was a demon to work and wasted nothing. Well, this seemed satisfactory so far, but Sunday dinner is always the test that I go by. We had, I remember, a stewed breast of veal and peas of our own growing. The cooking was quite satisfactory. At least two of the potatoes I should have been ashamed to offer a pig, but that was not Parker's fault. The waiting at table, however, was not quite up to my level. Hand me the peas again, Parker, and another time don't need to be asked. <coughs> To my great surprise, Parker drew a deep breath and then exhaled it sharply, producing a sound somewhat like oof pa. Uh, upon my word, I thought at first that it was meant for insolence, but immediately afterwards she handed me the peas with every appearance of respect and even of fear. She then left the room to attend to the fruit tart. Eliza, why does she make that curious oof pa sound? Oh, that's nothing. I asked her about it. She hurt her right kneecap, and every now and then it gives her a twinge. That's what makes her say, oof, pa. It'll pass off. Fruit tart, sir. Excellent, Parker. And what is it you are giving us by way of a fruit tart? Apple, <coughs> pa, and cranberry. And so it went on all day, and very unpleasant it was for me. You see, it is impossible to say oof, pa, without seeming to express contempt and disgust. For instance, I called her in to tell her the way I liked her to do my boots in the morning. It is a point I am rather particular about, and so far Parker had not quite satisfied me. If you slosh a lot of blacking over the laces just to save time for yourself, you waste time for your employer by making him wash his hands unnecessarily. Yes, sir. Moreover, if you use the blacking brushes for brown boots, you are practically throwing twelve shillings into the gutter. Pa. <laughs> And whether she meant it or whether she did not, it seemed as much as to say that I was making a silly fool of myself and she had no patience to hear any more of it. All this was on the Sunday. Monday, at breakfast, there was much less oof pa, and in the evening Eliza said that she thought the worst was over. On Tuesday the view seemed to be what you might call confirmed. No oof pa was heard all day, and we were both glad that Parker's kneecap was all right again. And on Wednesday it was oof pa here and oof pa there and oof pa all over the house. Worse than ever, Eliza, something will have to be done about this. I pay forty pounds for this house, and in spite of that, here's our servant goes about saying oof pa. I mean, the thing's quite out of place and, and might very easily frighten a visitor. Well, if we ever get a visitor, you can explain how it happens. Uh, pardon me, but I can do nothing of the kind. Parker's kneecap happens to be one of the things to which no self-respecting man can allude. Anyhow, it's only in the damp weather that she gets these twinges, and we had a lot of rain last night. That's what's done it. Well, that may be, but what safeguard have we got against? Rain. Ordinary umbrellas. Don't, don't try and un turn it off, Eliza. That's foolish. The thing has got quite on my nerves. In, in your place, I should go to the girl and say quite quietly, you suffer from a slight infirmity. I do not blame you for it. On the contrary, you have my sympathy. But you must be aware that it constitutes a total disqualification for service in a house of this class. Why, if I talked to her in that way, she'd think I'd gone clean off my burner. It's a head, Eliza, head! Besides, it's almost like giving her notice. It, it is quite like it and intended to be like it. it. It may be better expressed than is usual with... Oh, well, when I give a girl the sack, I like her to know what I mean. But I'm not going to sack this one. She's a good worker, and they don't grow on gooseberry bushes. And then there is only one alternative, and upon that I shall insist. A proper medical opinion must be taken, and these twinges with the accompanying oof pa must be cured. Somewhat to my surprise, Eliza did not disagree. I have given my words to the best of my recollection. Eliza says that she is perfectly certain I added, whatever the expense. If I did, and I have the gravest doubts about it, I must naturally have meant whatever the expense to Parker. 
Any thoughtful woman would have seen that for herself, but uh, Eliza, in her reckless, slapdash way, sent for the doctor the very next day. He came twice, and I suppose that sooner or later I shall have to pay him for it. Parker was then sent off to her married sister, rest being what it was alleged she required. There she lay in bed for eleven days, feeding, I have no doubt, on the fat of the land, doing no work whatever, and being paid for it by me all the time, and... I had to pay the occasional help to do Parker's work into the bargain. What, in that case, are the hospitals for? I pointed out these things to Eliza at breakfast on the Saturday that Parker was to return. I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. I may possibly have mentioned the subject once before, or, or at the most three times. Anyhow, the girl is cured and there's an end of it. When I got back from the city that day, I strolled into the garden and found Parker there cutting cress. In my experience, a kind word to one's inferiors is never thrown away. Ah, but, uh, that cress has been allowed to go past its prime, Parker, and uh, try not to give us quite so much stalk with it. I'm glad you're quite recovered. Thank you, sir. Oh, Parker! Oh, I'm quite well again and glad to get back to my <laughs> work. Well, what was I to do? What is any man to do under circumstances like that? Kneecaps are no subject for discussion between a married man and an unmarried woman, and I doubt if there is any gentleman in England who is more careful about what he says in the presence of a woman than I am. But I made no bones about it. An explanation of some kind I was determined to have. If your knee is better, um, why do you keep saying oof, pa, as if you were in pain? My knee is quite well, sir, and I have no pain at all. But I have got into the habit of saying oof, pa, now. And a habit's a thing you can't do away with. And I suppose I shall carry it to the grave with me. <laughs> she then burst into tears and went into the house. Presently, Eliza came out, looking rather worried. I don't know what you've been doing to that poor girl, but I do wish you wouldn't interfere with her. She talks of leaving at the end of her month, and after all the money we've spent on her, she wouldn't say that for nothing. If you wouldn't go sticking your oar in, I could manage a deal better. Very well, Eliza. From henceforth, I shall say nothing to you or to her or, or to anybody else uh, about anything. I walked straight away from her and into the house. As I passed the scullery window, I distinctly heard Parker stop sobbing for a moment to say, Oof, pa. Eliza showed herself rather more reasonable at breakfast the next morning and said she would speak to the girl about it. Parker is still with us and, by dint of much patient work on our part, is almost broken of the oof, pa habit. But there is no absolute certainty about it. I am sure that when visitors are present, I often feel almost as if I were walking on a volcano. In the first weeks following our move to Meadow Sweet, the flies there were absolutely beyond measure. I'm sure one Sunday morning the way they came buzzing around our bacon was like nothing in my experience. As I fished the third in five minutes out of my teacup, I said to Eliza, These flies cannot be allowed to go on. They, they must be stopped. Well, I don't want them. You can stop them as far as I'm concerned. Don't be silly, Eliza. We all have our duties to do in this life, and it ought not to be necessary for me to mention everything. What are the facts? In five minutes, by this clock, I've taken three dead flies out of my tea. And... It'll take you a long time to finish them that way. You missed my point, as usual. You! What I want you to see, in fact, what I want you to grasp, is that if a house of this class is properly managed, you get... An incident of that kind does not happen and cannot happen. Why? Simply because things are looked after, as it is. I suppose I'm either to be eaten alive by flies in a house I pay £40 a year for, or I'm to see to it myself. It's the same thing all round. I, 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 I buy a thermometer. I put that up. Who'd look at it if I didn't? Nobody. Nor want. Yeah, it's just, just what I knew you would do. <laughs> you take no intelligent interest in things. With, with the income we now enjoy, I... I presume that the purchase of a few fly strings or fly papers would be nothing out of the way, but instead of that... Hold on. Is it fly strings you want? No. What else have I been saying all this time? Never even mentioned them. Yes. You needn't make a face as if you just sat on a tin tack. For as no, one moment, please. The fact remains that though these flies are amounting to an mm. epidemic, you've never thought about fly strings, never ordered them... Ne never... Why, I ordered them yesterday. And that's the second time Binns has disappointed me this week. That boy of his has got a head like a sieve. Well, in that case, the fault lies entirely with Binns. It's in he's not the only grocer in the neighbourhood. I may have to give him a sharp lesson. 
We may now drop the subject. Eliza, unfortunately, is not quite so quick to see when a topic is exhausted. In fact, she went on and on. Afterwards, Eliza thought she would go for a turn and said that our neighbour, Mrs. Bast, who was down with another of her bilious attacks, had asked her to look in. Under these circumstances, I could not with propriety accompany Eliza, but I made no objection to her programme and told her she should find me in the garden on her return. When I looked at my watch again, it was nearly supper time. I folded up my garden chair, these things being ruined in no time if left out, and carried it through with me into the scullery. I had no conception that anything unusual was about to happen. I went calmly in, whistling a hymn tune as I went. Eliza said afterwards that if I had only looked where I was going, it would never have happened. Uh, the truth is that if Eliza had only had the sense to tell me that she had borrowed some of those filthy, sticky fly strings from Mrs. Bast and hung them in the scullery, I should naturally have kept my eye open for them. As it was, I ran my face right into one of them, and before I knew where I was, I had got a mouthful of dying flies and fish glue. And naturally, I made a snatch at it with my hand, and then it stuck to my hand, and it also stuck to my hair and wound round my neck. I made an infuriated dash for the sink and knocked against another of the abominations. One fly string would have been ample in that small scullery, as I pointed out afterwards. Eliza came in to see what was the matter and said that worse language for a Sunday evening she had never heard in her life before, but I seemed to have got the filthy stuff all over me. I was all gum and buzz. Even with Eliza's assistance, it was 25 minutes before I was in a condition to sit down to supper. It has always been a bit of a problem to me why our inventors and so-called men of science do not devote more attention to improvements in the home instead of wasting their time on flying machines and other extraneous matters. Take, for instance, the ordinary catch em alive -o, as vulgar people call it. All that is wanted is some simple substance which will stick to flies but will not stick to anything else. If I only had the leisure to think that thing out for myself... I'm convinced there would be money in it. Mr. Wise was a partner in the firm which has secured my services, being a nephew of Mr. Bagshaw's, but it was a very junior partnership with limited powers. He was much more affable than Mr. Bagshaw, but not in a way that I liked. Sometimes I would give him a perfectly serious answer to what seemed a perfectly serious question, and then he would burst out laughing. I dislike such goings-on. He got a friend, a Mr. Harnett, who was always in and out of the office. Mr. Harnett was pleasant and friendly enough, but there was a nasty, flashy look to him that was not at all to my mind. One day he overtook me as I was going to lunch, and asked me in an airy way to come and have a drink with him. At the time I confess that I took it rather as an honour. Presently, he dropped his voice and leaned in closer. I say, do you know anything about this bit of government business your firm is tendering for? As it happened, the figures of our tender had been through my fingers that morning. I did not at the time think that he meant any harm, especially as he was a friend of Mr. Wise's. All the same, Mr. Bagshaw had laid me down my rule, and I stuck to it. No, sir. Uh, I know nothing about it. You don't know of your firm's tendering? I can't say at all. Mr. Wise might be able to tell you. Well, you've been with your people some time, and you hold an important post there. Ought to be better paid, too. What you don't know, you could easily get to know, I think. But suppose you did happen to get the figures for that tender and happen to mention them over a friendly glass with me. Nobody would be harmed, and it would be worth a fiver to you. It's done every day in the city, and nobody thinks anything of it. You're... No, gentlemen. And I, I don't want anything to do with you. There's the money for my ginger beer. And I'm off. I had never had such a thing happen to me in the whole course of my experience. I was very much upset by it. I went back to the office. Uh, any attempt to eat luncheon after that would have been a farce. As bad luck would have it, Mr. Bagshaw was away at an arbitration, or I should have gone straight to him. But soon after three, in came Mr. Wise, and, to my astonishment, Mr. Harnett was with him. I could hardly believe my own eyes. However, that being so, it was clearly my duty to let Mr. Wise know at once what kind of a man he was associating with, and I went in at once to his office. And then came another surprise. As soon as they saw me, they both burst out laughing. 
<laughs> it's all right, old stick in the mud. Don't look so woebegone. You're not hurt. You've been spoofed. <laughs> Mr. Hardy, bet me there was not a man in our office he couldn't buy for a fiver. I took the bet and named you. It's all right, you won me my bet. And there's a sovereign for you. I'm afraid I rather lost my head then. You can keep your dirty money. I don't want it, and I don't want any more tricks of this kind either. A plucky lot you'd have done for me if I'd lost my birth through your foolery. People have been known to lose their births before now for impertinence. Keep a civil tongue in your head and clear out. But I had quite lost control of myself. I would remind you how many years I have been with this firm and, and what my character has been. I come here to do my work to the best of my abilities, not to be insulted. And I, I would sooner go than put up with it. You, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then came what I believe is called the reaction. I wished I had said rather less and expressed it differently. Towards the end of the afternoon, Mr. Wise and Mr. Bagshaw were shut up together, and at every moment I expected to be called in and given the sack. I thought of going and apologising to Mr. Wise, but I was afraid that if I saw the man I should lose my temper again. It came to be time for me to go, and Mr. Bagshaw and Mr. Wise were still shut up together and they had not yet sent for me. And this seemed to make it all the worse. I should have the thing hanging over me all night. In the train I made up my mind not to say a word to Eliza. There seemed to me just a chance that I might scrape through with an apology and promises for the future, and naturally I did not want Eliza to be worried at all. So I went into the house whistling, and when I saw Eliza I smiled intentionally. What's happened? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. <laughs> Sit down at once and tell me all about it. Well, things being so, I did tell her, and without attempting to defend myself. I told her quite honestly that I blamed myself for it. The only thing I blame you for is that you didn't say twice as much and put it twice as strong. My word, if I had that precious Mr Wise here, I'd talk to him. The idea of such a thing, with a man in your position in the office and all... Why, I couldn't have respected you if you hadn't let out at him a bit. Do him good. It, it is indeed a day of surprises. It never occurred to me that you would take it like that. Anyhow, it may do him good, but it won't do us any good. It's pretty certain I shall get the sack, and I don't want to be out of work. Just when... You're not going to get the sack, you old silly. Mr Bagshaw and Mr Wise were shut up for an hour together, weren't they? Rather more than that. Well, if Mr Bagshaw were angry with you for being disrespectful, how long would it take him to fire you out? By all that you've told me, about two minutes. No, he's got a rough side to his tongue and he don't take any trouble to make himself pleasant, but you've always said he acted fairly and business was business with him. You're not going. You needn't fret about that. I dare say Mr Bagshaw will call you in and give you a bit of a dressing down for the sake of discipline, and if he does, you better swallow it quietly. But that's the most there'll be to it. Uh, I'm by no means sure you're right, Eliza, but I will confess that you have revived my spirits considerably. Still, there's the suspense. It's, it's like that thing one's always reading about, the, the sword of... What was the man's name? Sword of Dam something or other. Even if you can't remember, you might behave yourself. The Sword of Damocles. Yes, of course. I knew it as well as I know my own name. Um... You wish to see me, Mr. Bagshaw? Mr. Wise reported you for gross insolence yesterday afternoon, said you'd have to go. Got anything to say about it? Um, I, I'm afraid I, I was insolent, but um, I had a great deal of provocation, sir. P perhaps Mr. Wise told you the circumstances? Yes. What was your grievance? We can't know if a man's to be trusted if we never test him. I've tested you twice myself while you've been here, though you knew nothing about it. Want to be insolent to me about it? Uh, no, sir. It's, it's just not quite the same thing. A, a, a test made quietly in the office for a good reason is one thing. Uh, this was different. Uh, I don't think Mr. Wise had any doubt about me, or he would never have betted. And he allowed a stranger to make a very insulting proposal to me just for his fun. It, it, well, it, it upset me. 
So you made a fool of yourself. If you'd come to me with your complaint, you'd have been in the right. I'm not going to pretend I approve of what Mr. Wise did. As it is, you're in the wrong. Yes, sir. Luckily for you, there's been nothing of this kind against you before. Also, Mr. Wise and myself didn't quite see eye to eye. Well, we've agreed to separate and he won't be here again. Bound to have happened. Right. Here am I, with the whole work thrown on my shoulders, one partner ill and another gone and never any use when he was here. How am I to get through it? Tell me that. Uh, well, so if there were anything... If there wasn't, you'd be a fool. You've been here long enough to know the routine, haven't you? And it looks as if you were to be trusted so long as you can keep your temper. Yes, sir. You'll have to help me. Old Pridget can do your work. Here, take these letters. Dictate the answers as you think they should be. Let me see them as soon as they're typed. Yes. Work in Mr. Wise's room for the present. Oh. Quick as you can, please. Uh, yes, sir. And so it went on for weeks. I had the most responsible things to do. Uh, people of importance who had come to see Mr. Bagshaw were handed over to me instead. Uh, I did most of the work that Mr. Wise did, and uh, I may fairly say that I did it a deal better. Uh, there never was a word of praise from Mr. Bagshaw. Uh, most days he repeated that he had not the faintest intention of making me a partner, and warned me to keep my tongue in check for the future. I do not know what my new position is, for I have never been told. I once heard a clerk say to a visitor, Mr. Bagshaw is out, but I have no doubt the manager could see you. Uh, by manager, he meant me, and... Uh, I did not correct him. Uh, Mr. Bagshaw did not even speak of an advance in salary, uh, but he paid me the advance, another fifty a year, and very welcome to Eliza and myself it was. Uh, when I thanked him, all he said was, Try and earn it. <laughs> if insults always turned out like this, uh, I could put up with another two or three. <laughs> In episode three of the Eliza stories by Barry Payne, Rebecca Front was Eliza and Mark Heap her husband. Maeve Alexander played Parker, David Belcher, Bagshaw and Wise, and Mark Evans, Harnett. The music was composed and performed by Herbert Chappell. The Eliza stories is directed by Ellen Dryden and is an independent production by First Rights Radio for BBC Radio 4.